and welcome to News Now on TV 360. I am Fidelia Aguncha. We begin the news with details of the meeting between President Muhammad Buhari and the 36 governors of the Federation. After the meeting, the President ordered a release of the outstanding London Parish Club refunds to the state. Buhari in a statement ordered the Minister of Finance, Kemi Adeoshun, and the Governor of the Central Bank of Nigeria, Godwin Emefili, to commence negotiations with the Governor so the funds can be paid before the end of the year. This will be the third tranche of their amount to be released to the Governors and the second this year. The use of the first release is currently being proved by the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission. Hours before the order for the release of the Paris Club refunds, the government also took steps to alleviate the, stru the struggles of workers in the country. President Mohamed Buhari inaugurated a minimum wage committee to structure a new minimum wage for workers in Nigeria. The committee, which will be chaired by former head of service and minister of housing, Ama Pepul, includes individuals from the public sector, private sector, Nigeria Employers Consultative Association, and Manufacturers Association of Nigeria. Other members were drawn from the Nigerian Association of Chambers of Commerce, Industry, Mines and Agriculture and Nigerian Association of Small and Medium Enterprises. Upon completion, the committee's suggestion will be sent to the National Assembly to undergo scrutiny before being passed into law. The current minimum wage in Nigeria is 18,000, while the labor unions are demanding an increase to 56,000 Naira. After a series of meetings today, President Buhari is expected to depart for Abidjan Cote d'Ivoire for the European Union African Union Summit. At the summit, the President will attend the official luncheon to be hosted by the government of Cote d'Ivoire in honor of visiting head of state, governments and other delegations. He is also expected to reiterate Nigeria's readiness to work with African and European countries to address the challenges affecting both continents such as peace and security. The summit themed investing in the youth for sustainable development will run from November 28 to 29, 2017. The Nigerian government is insisting it has won the war against terrorist sect Boko Haram. According to the Minister of Information and Culture, Lai Mohammed, the recent spate of terrorist attacks in the Northeast are, quote, last kicks of a dying horse, end of quote. The minister who was representing President Buhari at the commissioning of the Pulaku Radio in Yola also sought the assistance of Nigerians to completely eradicate the terrorist sect. Still on the anti-terrorism war, the government has taken a giant step towards achieving its promise to rehabilitate the Chibok schoolgirls recovered from the terrorist sect. President Buhari has approved the payment of 164 million naira as school fees for the 106 girls freed under his administration. The girls who were released in October 2016 and May 2017 will study at the American University of Nigeria in Yola State, at Damawa capital. Meanwhile, as efforts to rehabilitate the girls are underway, the president also pledged to ensure the release of the remaining 113 girls still under Boko Haram's captive. The Nigerian government is seeking the cooperation of its citizens in the plan to eradicate the menace of corruption. The Minister of Information and Culture, Lai Mohammed, in his speech on Monday, appealed to the media to stop mocking the federal government and support the anti-corruption war. According to Mohammed, there is serious resistance to the war against corruption because many Nigerians were beneficiaries of corruption. He, however, insisted that the anti-corruption war is moving in the right direction. Meanwhile, the Judicial Committee monitoring corruption cases have resolved to meet with the prosecuting bodies. In a statement, the National Judicial Council said the committee will engage the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission, EFCC, and the Independent Corrupt Practices and Other Related Offenses, ICPC, in furtherance of its mandate. The council, known as Corruption Financial Crimes Cases Trial Monitoring Committee, has also received over 2,300 ongoing corruption cases to work on. A week after it clashed with the Department of State Services, the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission, EFCC, has obtained a warrant to arrest and search the apartment of a former head of the service, Ita Ekbe Young.
The commission also procured a warrant to arrest a former director general of the National Intelligence Agency, Ayodili Uke. The warrants were approved by a chief magistrate court in the Federal Capital Territory, Nigeria. To diversify Nigeria's economy from all based, it is important the country it is important for the country to look into the tourism and hospitality sector and harness the potentials in it for economic growth. This is a position of stakeholders in the sector who converged on in Lagos to mark the 2017 Nigeria Travel Week. The one week event aims at bringing together buyers consumers, travel agencies, and the media to discuss the development of the tourism sector in Nigeria. TV360's Ngozi Okoye was at the roundtable and now reports. The contribution of tourism to Nigeria's GDP in 2014 is slightly above 4%. These, according to the World Travel and Tourism Council, WTTC, is a far cry to what the sector can offer. Over 10.4%. 10.4% of global income comes from tourism. Global income. And they think it's going to increase by 5% before 2027. Now, if 10.4% of global income, does anybody have an idea of what global income is at the moment? It's tourism. And we're not taking advantage of that part of that income. That income is not, do you know you don't force it? It's what they call free income. Free income meaning you've made your house suitable for me to visit. I will come, I will eat, I will spend. We do not yet know how powerful we are as a country tourism-wise. A country that has over 25 waterfalls, I do not know how many countries have that. Look at the culture. I do not know how many countries have over 250 ethnic groups with all of the flamboyance that we have, whether it is a Yoruba wedding you go to, or an Ijo wed wedding, or a Hausa wedding, the same flamboyance and beauty and color. If you've visited the um, Kano Doba, or you've been to the Agungu Fishing Festival, or you've been to uh, the Olojo Festival, all across Nigeria is beauty and flamboyance. The starting point, according to the organizers, is to promote domestic tourism, and the campaign is simple. Africans travel Africa. In the next five years, at least 20% of Nigerians are expected to have traveled Nigeria. If we deliberately decide to travel within our space, that means a weekend instead of sitting at home, I get a group of friends and we decide to go to a Papa Amusement Park, which has been refurbished. How many Lagosians know that has happened? And that is a public-private partnership. We had foreign investors coming into this country to develop that particular space. And yet, we have the issues around it. You know, we focus so much on the roads are bad, you know, there's no light, but we're nationals. And it's the nationals that build nations. I think Nigeria is known more for its outbound travel, as in Nigerians traveling out of Nigeria uh, rather than inbound. If I look at my, even just my perception of Nigerian uh, tourism and travel, uh, the people that I see coming, your inbound tourism is, ba is basically business, people in telecoms, people in oil and gas, uh, and very few of, of them coming for leisure. So Nigeria is not, is not known for its leisure tourism uh, assets. Despite being richly endowed with some of the best tourist attractions, the over-dependence on oil has resulted in Nigeria abandoning the sector over the years. But with the new focus of government to diversify the country's economy, tourism is beginning to get serious attentions. However, there are still challenges. Not insufficient power is what I should say. Uh, and the cost of generating those power is, is very expensive because everybody needs to have a generator and all that. So if you're a anywhere in the travel value chain or tourism value chain when you generate your own power it's, it's expensive uh, secondly the road uh, the infrastructure around roads and railways when you make it easy for people to come inbound and then be able to to explore the country uh, it makes it a lot easier than to be able to say we're going to develop that industry private sector and public sector needs to be speaking to each other and it has to start with the leadership of the highest office. Uh, in East Africa, we've seen heads of state 
who basically chair some of these tourism roundtables. It means that they are able to bring in their ministers and all tourism uh, authorities and agencies within the country to listen to the needs of, of the private sector, to come up together to develop a, a blueprint for tourism for the next 10 years. Experts believe Nigeria's population and size are factors that can encourage the speedy growth of tourism in Nigeria. Ngozi Okoye, TV 360, Lagos. Hello, hello, Haji, hello, Haji. Is it, right now I'm in Abuja. <laughs> no, no. Uh, hello, Adamu. Right now I'm in Kano. Yes. When I get back, I will just call you. Look, what is wrong with you? I'm talking on the phone and you are gesticulating and doing. What's wrong with you? Daddy, where exactly are we as we speak? Are you alright? This is Lagos. Well, you just lied to someone that we are in Abuja. Keep quiet there. Who told you you can tell an elderly person is lying? Daddy, you just lied. And by lying, you are raising corrupt children for the future of Nigeria. That is corruption, not in my country. Corruption not in my country. Glad to have you back. Let's look at business stories with Ngozi Okoye. Thank you, Fidelia. Nigeria's government plans to write to 500 wealthy Nigerians with property and trust abroad, urging them to come clean about their tax status or risk being Statutory prosecuted revenue and was fined. 406 In a statement, billion. the finance ministry said it had come across cases where people declared as little as 10 million naira as income but purchased expensive property, owned high specification vehicles and funded luxury events. It urged Nigerians to take advantage of the tax amnesty which expires in March to regularize their tax affairs. Africa's richest man, Ali Kodangote, has extended his business ventures to the Democratic Republic of Congo. The Nigerian has launched 1.5 metric tons per annum capacity cement plant in the country. The new plant, estimated at $300 million, has potentials for about 1,000 direct employment and thousands of several other indirect jobs. I'm delighted to warmly welcome you all here today to witness the commissioning of our new 1.5 million metric tons per annum Dangote cement plant built at the cost of $300 million cited here in Imphila in the Republic of Congo. I interest you to know that in 2015 we commissioned our plants in four African countries, namely Ethiopia, Zambia, Cameroon and Tanzania. Our Congo Brazil plant which began operations in, the, in, the, uh, in this last quarter of 2017 will be the fifth cement plant that will be inaugurating uh, in the last two years. As a matter of fact, our total production capacity across Africa at the end of May 2017 stood at 45.8 million tons per annum, making us one of the biggest cement producers on the continent. Our aspiration is to actually rank among the 10 top cement producers in the world by 2020 when our other projects are completed. Rice is the leading staple food Nigerians consume with over 6.4 million tons annually. This is less than half of what is produced locally. Importation of rice has risen over the years to about 2 billion naira annually, making Nigeria the second highest importer of the products in the world. To encourage local production of rice, growth and employment in states, James Four, a UK-funded Department for International Development, DFID, has embarked on a mapping exercise to provide more comprehensive on rice padding production in Nigeria, which will support the development of supply chain in the industry. TV360's Ngozi Okoye completes the story. 
investors, sector regulators, extension workers, and other key players in the known oil sector of Nigeria are gathered here. Their objective is connecting the existing value chain in the agricultural industry to promote rice production. Over the past two to three years, it's become a lot clearer that we're looking to really drive towards self-sufficiency. And so we're now looking to see how we can really engage with players in the sector um, to capture value in, in rice in Nigeria. We hope to unlock much needed finance, uh, which will be used to develop the agri sector. Our, our principles are very, they, you know, they have a social responsibility and, uh, and have mandated that we impact uh, smallholder farmers, which is why you find us uh, this, uh, you know, at this level of the value chain, at the production level also. Even the Nigerian government recognizes the economic importance of achieving self-sufficiency in production of rice locally. But there are challenges which makes hitting its targets of producing 7 million tons of high-quality boiled rice unrealizable. And Nigeria is very close to achieving self-sufficiency in rice. And by 2018, emission targets rice production of 7 million metric tons. As of 2015, rice demand in Nigeria stood at 6.3 million metric ton. It's also the fact that locally produced rice is safer, tastier, and healthier. The key challenge that farmers face is access to working capital debt. Uh, the reality is that uh, farming is a very working capital intensive business that requires a lot of debt and they need access to that debt to buy high quality inputs and access products and services that will enable them to increase their productivity to world class standards. Uh, access to extension is also a massive problem. There's uh, actually a ratio of one to two thousand extension, uh, I mean one extension worker to two thousand farmers which is uh, problematic if you look at it. It means that the produce will not be qualitative or quantitative enough to satisfy the market demand. The first thing is lack of availability of the raw material, which is paddy. Uh, and that is the first problem, very biggest problem for the, all the rice millers in Nigeria, whereby they get only 50% of the paddy which they require. So the capacity utilization of their investment, that is the first problem. Second problem is, 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 is the interest rate. For the farmers and for the investor also, on which they get operating fund. That is the second thing which uh, even Nirsal and CBN is working uh, and, and there are schemes and, and we are utilizing that facility. Third thing is post-harvest logistics, connectivity to the markets, regulation of the markets, so that whatever arrives into the market in a good time, in a good quantity, there are off-takers who buy it instantly and farmers who have invested for all six months or five months of cropping, they get their returns immediate. Private sector investment is also believed to be one of the major factors that could drive rice revolution in Nigeria. But these investors have their concerns. There are a couple of risks that investors have had to deal with um, in, in financing our culture. Um, Nasir, when he spoke earlier today, he mentioned one of them, which is that there's literally no data available or no accurate data available um, for investors in Nigeria. Because before you do an investment, you have to have a good understanding. Would this crop grow well in that region? Is the soil good enough? How much fertilizer should I, should I apply? Um, how much money do I require to invest in irrigation, or invest in the mill? That data is not available. Even in terms of planning your supply chain, if should I set up my mill in Niger State or should I set it up in Lagos State, that will require a good understanding of how many farmers are in those two states. There's no data that can really provide that, that perspective for investors. Also in terms of managing value chain risk. Experts say Nigeria is a big country. We should be a net exporter of rice and not importer. Nigeria's exports, they believe, can affect the market in the West African sub-region. Ngozi Okoye, TV360, Lagos. It was a bearish market at the Nigeria Stock Exchange as it began the trading week in a loss of 0.31%. The Composite All Share Index ended the day at 37,250.78 basis points, maintaining the 37,000 points attained last week. Meanwhile, the equity capitalization dropped back to its 12 trillion naira mark as it closed at 12.972 trillion naira. 
The top four advances for the day were Nigeria Breweries, Fort Oil, PZ Cousins, and Dangote Sugar. On the other hand, Marble, Guinness, Stambic Abertissi, and Flour Mill experienced downtown by 1.24, 1.96, 4.74, and 2.86%, respectively. The top traders' charts in terms of volume saw Wapik Insurance PLC, Fidelity Bank, and Transnational Corporation of Nigeria maintaining the list. Tantalizers and Zenith Bank were also there. Summarizing the market, 942.716 million shares valued at 4.778 billion Naira traded in 3,868 deals. And that's it on business. We'll return with more stories after the break. Stay with us. <laughs> The volume of your music is too loud. And how is that your business? It is disturbing me. I can't sleep. And the same way you are disturbing my right to good music and where I enjoy it. Eh? What's wrong with you? Is there another person complaining? Uh, maybe we thought that uh, you have lost your mind. Are you, you having see? a party? I'm just respecting you, sir. You remember, I've my husband too. You will not understand why we are complaining because you do not care about other people except yourself. Look, the transformation we need in this country begins in this compound. Yes, now. From you, you, and I. This, your selfishness is an offshoot of corruption. Uh -huh. And corruption, not, not in, in my country. country. Oh, you know. Eh? Can you go, go to your bank? Oh. Corruption, not in my country. Welcome back. Sudan has arrested a militia chief described by a human rights group as the poster child for Janjaweed atrocities in Darfur nine years after he was appointed as a government aide. Musa Hilal was arrested by Sudan's counterinsurgency forces after fierce fighting near his hometown in North Darfur. The arrest was carried out by the Rapid Support Forces after the death of 10 of its members, including a commander on Sunday. He has been accused of being a leader in the pro-government Arab Janjaweed militia, which carried out a campaign of ethnic cleansing in Darfur in 2003 and 2004. Fighting has forced more than 10,000 Somalis to flee their home and seek safety in the capital Mogadishu. This is according to the Norwegian Refugee Council. The charity is calling for an urgent halt to the fighting and aerial bombardment of the region in order to hopefully halt the flow of refugees. Somalia has been hit by conflict between militant, militant Islamist group Al-Shabaab and the government backed by the UN and African Union. The U.S. has carried out many airstrikes in the country over the years to target Al-Shabaab, but has been accused of causing civilian casualties as well. <laughs> Moving on to sports stories now, Michael Emenalo has been appointed the new sporting director of Monaco less than a month after his surprise decision to quit Chelsea. The Nigerian who had been at Chelsea since 2007 resigned in October. Chelsea are yet to make a decision on Emenalo's replacement and whether or not they will appoint a new technical director or split his responsibilities across a number of roles. Former Italian footballer Gennaro Gattuso has returned to his former club, AC Milan. The 39-year-old has been appointed as new manager after the club dismissed Vicenzo Montella on Monday. Montella leaves the club in seventh place after a disappointing start to the season. Despite a huge summer spending worth £200 million, Gattuso played for AC Milan in a successful 14-year spell between 1999 to 2013. He played 387 games for the club, scoring 10 goals. 
The International All Athletics Federation, IWAF, has upheld the global ban placed on Russia athletes ahead of the 2018 Winter Olympics. The country has been banned by the IWAF since 2015. The body insists Russia is yet to meet its demand for the lifting of the ban. Ruin Anderson, independent chairman of the RAAF Tax Force, looking into doping in Russia, said several key milestones remain outstanding before the ban can be lifted. Well, that's all on News Now. Thanks for watching. I am Fidelia Aguncha.